There are many stories about the xenomorph, things like its origin, biology, behavior, social structure, and intelligence, and I have covered many topics around the alien before. In this video, I want to cover two stories that are connected. The first one is called Aliens Once in a Lifetime, which was released around February of 1999. The other one is Aliens Apocalypse, The Destroying Angels, which was released from January to May of 1999. This one is shown in black and white. It's a bit short, but it has connections to the story of the next comic book. It also has a section where they go into the alien morphology, so I'll go into this one first. This one is in full color, and it's a long story, but there's a few things that make it stand out. It details that xenomorphs have been around longer than we thought, and they were on different planets. The space jockey is mentioned, and we see a new type of alien. Now let's begin with the first comic book story. Dr. Natasha Foe is meeting with someone named Casper Tellurian, who is affiliated with the Goholgood Institute. They've been following her research for Whale Utani for some time. She was recommended for the Turgo Myers Project, Linguafoda acarensis. It's about the aliens. They're in possession of a remarkable find, a rich, vital environment that the creatures thrive, but one never exposed to humans until now. This gives Dr. Foe a chance to test her theories on the alien's morphology. Mr. Tellurian has read her papers on the subject. The opportunity she's always dreamed of has finally showed up. But Turgo Myers is a barren planet, a lifeless chunk of volcanic rock. Either way, she accepts the mission. A dropship will take her to the region known as Wells Church. There's going to be a trail of markers that guide her along the only accessible entryway to the site. From there, she'll be greeted by an acquaintance named Dr. Kira Nix. She's an Animal League specialist and a close associate of Mr. Tellurian. When Dr. Foe meets Kira Nix, she tries to be social with her about their line of work and connection to Mr. Tellurian but Kira avoids the questions and tries to focus on their objective. They need to locate their quarry, gather all data, then contact the dropship for departure. After this, Mr. Tellurian's people will do the rest. As they venture forward, it's not long until Kira picks up on something. She pulls out her weapon and fires a few shots into the vegetation. The image that runs off is an alien. Dr. Fo inspects the blood drops from the alien and is surprised by what she sees. The blood has not corroded any of the plant life. They can adapt. Bioimperatives meant for protection or ensuring survival, like acid blood, are not genetic constants. She would compare this to the moon jellies on Palau, which adapted to enclosed nitrogen-rich lakes. Their defense mechanism, which were stinging tentacles, had withered away. They lived off internal algae. Dr. Fo thinks this goes beyond adaptation. The aliens secluded here may be representative of an archetypal state, but first, they need to find the hive to gather more research. The other mystery is why Kira, who is supposed to be a scientist, is also carrying a military weapon. As they continue up the trail, Dr. Fo would lose her balance and fall. She survives, but finds herself in a bad situation. The hive they were looking for, well, she found it. She remembers that ants communicate with airborne pheromones. Could aliens do the same to warn of predators? But something is affecting the aliens. She's not sure what it is, and just then, a weapon is fired in her direction, hitting an alien. A group of armed men show up. The aliens focus their attention on them, and a battle commences. Dr. Foe tries to run off, but is tripped by Kira. She then realizes that she was set up from the start. The company used her. It all makes sense now. Kira having a weapon, even though she was said to be a scientist, she's also familiar with the terrain. This was not the first expedition. Kira was here before. Kira says she was already here, but this was the first human expedition. Nobody knew about these creatures before Dr. Foe showed up. They need to leave, but first, Kira has to pick up another passenger. When Dr. Fo returns, she speaks to Tellurian. She found a monitoring device sewn into her pack. She asks him, what experiments are they doing out there? 
what are they hiding, but he remains silent, and Dr. Fo walks away. After she leaves, Tellurian calls to another person named Pratika to come out of hiding. Even though she's a loose end to the company, they still achieved their goal. Dr. Fo confirmed their suspicions. They can now proceed with the Mandala Directive. Dr. Fo will be of service to them, much as another person named Alecto Throop. Later on, Dr. Fo figures out why she was left alive, and knowing the company has secrets. There's more to learn, and they need her. She thinks the alien could be more than adaptive. They might be able to rewrite their programming to learn from experience. She also thinks that these creatures are older than the stars. They are perceptive, adaptable, excellent pupils when they have the right teacher. The rest of the story is continued in Alien's Apocalypse, The Destroying Angels, which is a pretty long comic book, but it has a deep look into the history of the xenomorph and the space jockey. This next story starts off with a few men within some type of ship or facility. They gathered all the alien eggs they could find and secured them within a hold. A group of men leave the area, but one of them stays behind. Mr. Rhodes has a chest burster inside him, and it's not long until it emerges. He would be a danger to the others if he joined them. Shortly after they leave, Mr. Rhodes goes through that painful experience, and the alien scurries away. The story shifts over to Alecto Throop, meeting with Mr. Tellurian and his great owl Wicket. This is only a brief meeting, as they recount their previous meeting at the Goholgood Institute, where she met other associates of Tellurian, like Dr. Emil Factor, Dr. Burroughs, and Pratika. The rescue mission that Throop operates was hand-picked by these members in front of her. They focus purely on scientific research, unlike other corporations that are mainly out for profit. She is told that the Goholgood is a scientific venture, existing in the shadows of the conglomerates. A picture of a man is shown to her. This man is Dr. Lucian Ketel. He is a founding member of the Goholgood. He is a seeker, a man with the vision to reshape our world. Dr. Ketel had connections with Wayland Utani, up to a point where he could access classified files, which he shared with the Goholgood Institute. That's where he discovered the data about the Nostromo starship, and when they encountered a space-faring craft of non-terrestrial origin, this was located on a body in the Zeta-2 reticuli system. Now, the conglomerates are all over that sector, but their motives are small. Dr. Cato saw a bigger picture. Armed with his resources, the Goholgood went on its own astronomical search. About five years ago, his team discovered an object orbiting a planet in the Shamblo system. Its broadband spectrum matched that of the Willendutani derelict perfectly, we found our own mystery ship. One year later, Dr. Ketel set up a team to investigate. The ship they took was called the Savannah, a prototype with a particle drive, and the technology to bend space instantaneous belongs to them. At first, the expedition was successful beyond all expectations. Ketel would regularly send reports, detailing their analysis of the ancient fossilized crew of the ship. It was unbelievable. But then, about a year and a half ago, the reports grew erratic and eventually, Cato would stop sending in reports. Diagnostics show that no equipment malfunctioned. Life support scans registered no disruptions. Yet, communications have stopped entirely. Dr. Cato's team does not respond anymore. Something is wrong. They want Dr. Cato, his team, and the research brought back. This is where Electothrope comes in. When Tellurian is talking to Miss Throop earlier, he says to her that there is more to this story that she needs to know. The reason Dr. Ketel left for the stars was the expedition's hidden motive. There was a paleontological dig in Australia around 26 years ago. This team was funded by the Goholgood. They discovered a strata of shale that predated by a billion years, the oldest previously known formations. It was etched with unnervingly abundant traces of life. His last message to her is to learn to look past the surface. Dr. Ketel is a great man, but great men are often unpredictable, and greatness is always achieved through great sacrifice. We then meet Captain Mutombo, 
who commands the ship called the Rachel. Other members are Baal, Arch, Cain, Daimos, Corfu, and Jellicoe. The ship may not look advanced, but that's because they don't want to draw attention to it. When Throop returns to her room, she finds a delivery sent to her. A letter is attached. It's from Tellurian, just giving her advice, along with sending his bird wicket to help her. They come across a Willingdutani mining operation and try to quietly pass by, but Mutombo is able to locate a planted spy amongst the crew. He says, at close range, shortwave conglomerate broadcasts tend to feed back on their reprogrammed hunter-seeker androids. The ship activates the particle shift, then some time later, they reach the massive ship they were searching for. A team suits up and prepares to board. They would enter the massive ship, and darkness fills the room. They notice the airlock installation still functions, but there's no sign of life. As they explore around, they come across a giant being, similar to the one we saw on LV-426 within the derelict spacecraft. Meanwhile, their scanning system still shows no signs of the Savannah ship that Dr. Catel used. The atmospherics seem to check out okay, and Catel's life supports are still up, so the team can decompress and remove their helmets. Some campsite will be found nearby, but it seems abandoned. Corfu looks around the area to find a skeleton, then some liquid drops near his location. He shines his light behind him to see a large alien. Alecto and a few others would find some type of machinery, which looks like a relay complex. This device is meant to bounce a signal from another location. She thinks there's some deception going on here. Perhaps Dr. Cato and his team are long gone. Suddenly, they hear a scream behind them. It's Corfu. The team runs in the direction of a scream, but as they arrive, they find that it might be too late. She starts looking around, knowing something is out there waiting. She recalls what Tellurian told her. He was trying to warn her. He knew what was down here. An alien would appear. The synthetic ball pushes Throop away, giving her a chance to run. She climbs over the large being, only to see a pack of alien eggs. The alien pursues her. Throop makes it outside the dock, but the alien catches up to her and closing in. Ball would show up again to save her, but is attacked by the alien again, but this time he is ripped in half. Throop makes it inside, but still wants to go outside to retrieve Ball to find out what he knows. She goes out to grab his head, but the alien appears above the doorway. She jumps in just as the alien tries to grab her. Mutombo detaches their ship from the giant spacecraft and starts to leave. Just as Throop walks in saying she still has an associate back there, Ball tells them Corfu is no longer alive. He thinks Corfu has become some sort of food source. He claims he saw it. Throop would later get the owl wicket that was sent to her by Tellurian and explains to everyone why she has the owl. Tellurian thinks that if she studies the owl hard enough, it will somehow help with the mission. She spent a lot of time going through the files that Tellurian had sent her. There's a lot to go through, but from what she read, there's a whole lot more to the mission than they were told, and it revolves around Dr. Catel. It turns out that the Goholgood Institute learned of the existence of this alien species through the Wailing Dutani files lifted by Catel. The conglomerate also discovered these things within the derelict that was in the Zeta 2 reticuli system, but they probably did not have much information on them. The files also indicate Tolurin suspected that Catel had a secret agenda behind his expedition. Catel had a crazy theory about these creatures that they invaded Earth billions of years ago, exterminating all life on the planet. This was based on some questionable evidence from an Australian dig, which was matched with some descriptions of the Willendutani derelicts creatures. It seems like they wiped out the crew on that ancient ship, and the same thing occurred here on this ship that they found. Wicked would then fly away from Throop and sit on top of a container. There's something inside. They don't know what's in here, so they use an x-ray device and look inside. And what they see is an alien egg. The same ones that Throop saw on the ship they were just on. She saw a whole nest of them. Mutombo runs the serial number again to find it was a gift from Will and Yutani. Throop tells him 
that once he looks at the files about these creatures, this cargo was loaded by Deimos and should be jettisoned into the void of space as soon as possible. Mr. Massey would later get a fix on Dr. Cato's position, its way out there past the Daxon Ray Cluster. They were also able to salvage Ball's head and reattach it to the body of Deimos, but he makes them aware that his new body might have sleeper directives in place, which could make him turn on them, so he should be monitored closely. They track the ID signal of the Savannah ship to a foreign planet. It lands, and a team is assembled and sent out. It's not long until they come across a big hole, which is said to be a construct. The signal of the Savannah is somewhere down below. In the lower sections, they locate the ship, but also come across more aliens. They try to use their firearms, but it seems like the rifles are not enough to stop them. They would be rescued by Dr. Cato himself. He sprays them with a gas and they pass out, which is later explained to be a vaccine. It was refined by Dr. Cato by using the DNA of Dr. Rhodes, the man we saw at the start of the story with a chest burster in his body. The aliens here are called angels, but another name is lingua foda acaronsis, which means foul tongue from acaron. They spray the vaccine on themselves, which makes the aliens avoid any contact with them. But something seems to have gotten their attention. As rumbling occurs around them, it's their ship coming down the pit to land. The aliens can sense something aboard. It must be the egg that was planted on the ship by Deimos. Throop would enter the ship as the doors open. They pick up the owl wicket and form a plan on who goes back for Dr. Cato and who stays on the ship. Matumbo was also taken by the aliens, but it might be too late for him. Dr. Cato would give them a tour of the necropolis. What led them to this planet was the crew of the derelict. They left behind a detailed description of their journey. Dr. Nelligan, a linguistic expert, was able to crack some of it, enough to reprogram the Savannah's rudder and bring them to this location. It was one of perhaps thousands of worlds these mysterious giants colonized. This is the part where Dr. Cato explains the research he found. There was a paleontological expedition that discovered advanced life in a rock around 3.2 billion years old. This predates all accepted timelines for complex life on Earth. This did not fit in the pre-existing notions and was buried within the Gohogod bureaucracy. When he saw the descriptions of the alien creature on Acheron, he was able to make over 100 comparisons between those aliens and the ones within the fossils. They were essentially the same creature. Around 3.2 billion years ago, Lingua Foda exterminated all life on Earth, as well as on the Acheron derelict and any other place where they flourish. They were a universal wave of extinction. He sees this as the wrath of God. This prediction might be a little far-fetched, but he has yet to show her something else that will truly challenge their concept of time. Back on their ship, one of Cato's followers, Mr. Sten, is able to get on board as Ball opens the bay doors for him. Mr. Massey tells Ball that none of those people were to board until Throop came back. He thinks they're all crazy with their talk about giants and angels, so he grabs a gun and searches for Mr. Sten. He runs into Mr. Sten down a hall and gets knocked out. Mr. Sten would take the firearm and command Ball to lead him to the alien eggs on the ship. He opens the container and willingly becomes a host. But Mr. Massey shows up and shoots him down. The facehugger runs towards him and leaps on his face. Mr. Massey calls out for Ball to help him, but Ball does nothing. He just watches as the facehugger overcomes Mr. Massey. Dr. Cato would show Throop another discovery. All the giants in this sealed chamber were placed in some form of catatonic suspension, which might occur on a molecular level. He believes their race was on the verge of extermination by the alien creatures. The giants resorted to this, which is an attempt to hibernate and outlast their destroyers. But time has affected all of them except this one. It's the only one left alive and he has yet to outlast the angels. He's intrigued by the science that has kept a being alive for over three billion years. The aliens that eradicated this race long ago were all gone, 
their eggs did not fare well over the ages on this planet. The aliens that appear on this planet were brought here by Dr. Catel. Throop would ask him, where are your men? And he tells her, she already met them. Their souls were granted eternal life within the form of the destroying angels. They willingly gave up their lives, allowing the angels to birth, which gave him the opportunity to study the living organism. Their sacrifice served the angels and science. Tension between them starts to escalate. Dr. Cato thinks the others do not understand his motives, so he attacks Throop and runs away. She would later gather the files left behind by Dr. Cato and transfer all of it to the ship's database, then find a way to escape, even if that means they don't bring back Dr. Cato, the company might be more interested in his research. Then we see Ball, who is possibly under the control of Wayland Yutani by now. He takes an alien egg, leaves the ship, and plants it in front of the last living giant. As the others try to make their way back to the ship, Jellico gets taken by an alien, then Arch gets attacked by another alien as she protects Throop. Then Dr. Cato returns to save them and asks her if their ship had carried eggs of the Linguafoda acarensis. And yes, it did. Dr. Cato found an alien egg near the giant, the one experiment he never dared to try. Someone else did. They conclude it must have been Ball, as he might be overtaken by Deimos's programming. Dr. Cato has a change of heart during this point, now realizing that Will and Yutani has sabotaged his work, and they conducted another senseless experiment on a lingua foda. He is predicting the great cosmic cycle of extinction will arrive soon again. He wants Miss Throop to take his research back to Earth and convince them that the angels have returned. One and a half billion years ago, the giants who built this city grew into a space-faring race. For a time, they dominated our galaxy. Then the angels appeared and restored balance. Now the cycle has come full around. The angels, exterminating fury extended as far as to the planet Earth. Homo sapiens are the space-faring race, and the angels have begun to take note. One day, too soon for our race, a tripwire will be struck, a critical point will be reached, and these superbly adaptable engines of destruction will sweep like a cleansing tidal wave over all creation. Later on, Dr. Cato makes a deal with Throop. If she sends her synthetic back to the ship, he will take her to where her friends are being held within the hive. But if she does not return in two hours, the ship can take off without her. As Throop is brought into the hive by Cato, they do find Mutombo and Jellico, but they cannot get any closer as some aliens have followed them. Then, they feel vibrations in the ground and all around them. The last surviving giant could not escape the angels. A new alien smashes through the walls, but this one is massive, extremely large. This new alien shows to be disconnected from the others as it attacks them, and the other aliens seem to not accept it into their group, and then a battle between them occurs. Throop is able to rescue Jellico and help her walk away, but Mutombo is already doomed. It's too late for him. As the two of them get out, Cadel chooses to remain behind to share the same fate of his men. His last words to her are to not trust the Goholgood, tell the people what he discovered. As Throop and Jellico make it to the landing bay doors, it opens, but another alien leaps down towards them. Their escape seems to be blocked. But then, a large alien hand reaches in to grab it and pulls it out. The ship takes off and the structure continues to crumble. As the ship heads back home, Throop wonders what should be done with Dr. Cato's research. If she brings it back to the Goholgood, it all gets buried and more incidents of alien confrontation crop up and get buried as well. They would keep this secret to themselves. She starts to believe Cato just a bit about his angels and his theory on extinctions. Crazy or not, he did glimpse a bigger picture. He may have been a monster, but he may have done what was necessary. And that is the end of the story, Aliens Apocalypse, The Destroying Angels. Some elements of this story could be similar to the movie Prometheus, 
where they both find a map which leads them to meet these giant life forms. Both stories include a character that is willing to sacrifice human lives to study the alien creature. So what do you think about these two stories? Tell me in the comment section. To see more videos like this, subscribe to my channel and leave a like on it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.